Hey everybody, History Guy Gaming here, and in this tutorial we'll be looking at the information and realism options that are available throughout the game. Information is provided to players during the game through a series of tool tips that are available anytime you hover over something of interest. So for example, when starting a campaign, if you're looking over the different uh, available options here, you can hover over each one and you'll see that information will pop up. And that's true anywhere uh, in the battle screens, during the campaign, or even before you start a campaign. To control that, in the settings you'll find tooltips time appearance. The lower that scroll bar, the quicker the tooltips will appear. If you go to high, it takes much, much longer, several seconds. Or you can turn it off and tooltips won't appear at all. I would suggest keeping that uh, not highlighted and keeping this as low as possible so you can get information as quickly as you can. The field book is your quick guide to all the basic information to help you get started and to learn how various things work in the game. You can access that field book here from the main menu, but it's also accessible during the campaign at any time. You can click on the left to see any particular topic that you'd like to read more about and then read and scroll down to see even more and in the case of these tutorial videos which you've already found uh, you click on the links to take you to the appropriate video to help you learn more here in the options you have a number of choices when it comes to your graphics settings screen resolution whether or not to have full screen graphics quality depending on the needs of your system uh, whether or not to have historic fonts and all of the written notifications that you receive in the game we've already talked about tooltip time appearance and then the map scroll speed of course again low means that scrolling across the map will move slower if you like it to go a little faster you can slide it up Game options are things that you want to choose carefully because they cannot be changed once you've begun a campaign. In the campaign, both sides have a rating uh, showing their relations with various European nations. These relations are controlled by pre-war policies that you select, policies that you choose during the game, as well as the amount of money that you choose to put into your diplomacy subsidy. Here you can see our finances tab which can be accessed during the campaign and on the right side you see the subsidy sliders. Each one of these has an impact on gameplay. If we decide to invest more money in diplomacy that will improve our relations with European powers. You can see here that currently as the Union uh, in May of 1863 we have a 30% chance of British intervention. That can be improved by affecting this slider. Now the diplomacy slider can be impacted even more by the policies that are selected. In the Policies tab, you can see that there are a number of different policies, and we'll uh, talk about these more in future tutorials. The Agriculture Policy thread will allow for things that will improve uh, our European relations, and the same goes for Diplomacy. The more we uh, select Diplomacy policies, the more we will be able to invest in the Subsidies tab. If during the course of the campaign we are able to get a European power to 100% intervention, it is possible we could see them intervene in the war in the form of armies and fleets that will show up on the campaign map, and that can lead to field battles against those European powers for our enemies. The Fog of War setting controls whether or not during battles you can see only what your units see or if you can see everything that's happening on the battlefield. So for example, here uh, in the historic battle of Shiloh, we are the Union, and you can see that the fog is displayed by a gray shroud that kind of darkens the map in any area where we're not actually able to see what's going on. The lighter areas represent the areas that my units can actually see on the battlefield. Now you can actually change this, turn it off and on during a battle if you want to. You go here, and you can click on these binoculars where it says fog of war visualization. By clicking that and turning it off, you can now see that the fog of war visualization is turned off. Now it doesn't allow you to suddenly see all of the enemy units on the field. That is determined by those settings before you start a campaign. But it does allow that visualization of the fog of war to be turned off. Now it's important to note that even within the area where the fog of war is not a factor, there are still times when certain enemy units may not be visible to your troops, especially smaller ones like skirmishers that could still be hidden on the screen. 
In battles, whenever you're looking at information about the enemy, for example, here uh, in the Consolidated Strength Report, it gives me information on the Confederate forces. These are always estimates based on my intelligence and not actual numbers. Now, during a campaign, all units on the map gather intelligence. Intelligence can actually be seen uh, in the paper map filter, which you can access by zooming all the way out on the campaign map. Then over here to the right, we click on the paper map filters, which is shown right here, and then click on intelligence. Now, based on how dark the area is, that's how good our intelligence is in that particular area. Now, we're the Confederates in this case, and you can see that our intelligence starts to get thinner and then disappears altogether the further north you get, the further away from our units. Now, the larger the enemy force, for example, a large army of 50 or 60,000 men, is going to give us much better intelligence information than, say, a small enemy brigade that's operating behind the lines somewhere. Looking at the map, just to give you an example here, uh, when we see a question mark like that, that means that's actually our best estimate on where that unit is. We really don't know for sure. That's just about where we think they are. The closer to our lines and the closer to the dark red areas of intelligence, the better my intelligence on those units is going to be. We also have estimates on things like movement. So you can see here the blue arrow indicates that we believe this is the, the direction in which that particular enemy unit is currently moving. Now, these numbers, like any amount of information that we receive on enemy forces, are estimates. We don't know for sure that the Army of the Potomac actually has 75,752 men, but we believe that's around the amount that he has currently in that force. Intelligence is based on a number of things, as I've already mentioned, but commander attributes actually go into the intelligence gathering uh, information as well. So, for example, here with Stonewall Jackson, uh, his information on intelligence comes in part from his initiative and cunning scores, which in this place are really good. He's a master of mystification. He's uh, five stars. He's very aggressive on initiative, and those help us with our intelligence gathering. A more cautious and less cunning commander, someone like George B. McClellan, for example, is going to tend to overestimate the enemy strength more. Uh, that makes sense. We've seen that historically in places like the Peninsular Campaign, where McClellan repeatedly overestimated the enemy forces that he was facing. Now, this brings another factor into play when it comes to the battles. Even if you personally know that you outnumber the enemy force on the battlefield, that doesn't mean that your commander knows that. If he's got a low initiative, a low cunning score, that may affect his willingness to withdraw from a battle because he thinks he's outnumbered when he really isn't. And you can't do anything to stop him from doing that when it happens during a battle. Now let's talk about order delays, which is another uh, choice that you have to make when starting a new campaign. Orders are distributed to your armies from the War Department. So if I'm the Confederates and my capital's in Richmond, that's where the orders start, even if they're issued to the Trans-Mississippi Department all the way across the Mississippi River in Missouri. If I'm the Union, that's Washington. So those orders go out from the War Department, and so there's a delay. It takes time for that to happen. If the unit's within range of a telegraph station, which there's a Morse dotted line that'll lead to the unit, I'll show you an example of that. So, for example, here, if I click on the Union 8th Corps in Winchester, you can see the dot, dot, dash, dot, dot, dash. Uh, that is a telegraph uh, line that is allowing me to quickly issue orders from the War Department in Washington directly to the 8th Corps in the field in Winchester, Virginia. Anytime an order is issued, it takes time to write that order, to distribute it to your various commanders, and then the unit in question is going to need some time to take that order and prepare it for action. In the campaign, that delay is shown through a timer. Right here, you can see the Army of Western Virginia currently has an hour and 23 minutes uh, until it receives the orders, and then it will take some time to put those orders into uh, readiness. Now, the further that those orders have to travel to reach their destination, and the lower the readiness of the unit receiving those orders, uh, the longer it will take. You can see here Robert E. Lee has excellent readiness, so he's going to quickly take those orders and turn them into action. 
If an order is given to a unit, it will be obeyed only after the order reaches the unit. So don't expect things, either on the campaign map or in battles, to happen instantaneously. That's not how it happened in real life. It's not how it happens in this game. Something to keep in mind about orders, and this is true in the campaign as well as on the battlefield. When I issue orders, so for example, I've told the 8th Corps to start moving toward Frederick, Maryland, uh, which they have just now received that order and they are starting to carry it out. If I decide to issue new orders before they've completed the old orders, let's say I decide instead to tell the 8th Corps to move uh, down here. Uh, they're going to continue to carry out the old orders until the new orders arrive, and then the whole cycle will repeat itself. They will have to process those orders, put them into the field, and then change the orders, as you've seen that happen. Now, that happened quickly because I have a telegraph line. In cases where there is no telegraph line, it may take much longer uh, for the new orders to be received and for the unit to change course. Naval units are an exception to this rule. They do not have order delays. They will carry out their orders instantaneously. In battles, orders are distributed inside the order of battle. So, for example, if I order a corps commander to move his entire corps, his orders then are going to be filtered down uh, from the army to the corps commander. If I order a division to move, those orders will come from the corps commander down to the division and then down to his corresponding units. When an order is given to a commander, that order will show up as an animated command line. In this case, you can see I've given an order to General Sherman to move his division. And so we have a command line appearing from General Grant, who is his immediate superior. Once that order is actually delivered, that command line will disappear and we will know that Sherman has received his order and he's making preparations to carry it out. He is not going to carry out the order until he receives that order and has time to prepare. So be prepared for that to take a little bit of time. You can see now he received the order, it's been prepared and now it's being carried out. If I send a new order before the old one is received and has begun to be carried out, expect that that's gonna take some time because the old order, even if it supersedes the new one, uh, has to be received just as the first order was. Now, unlike in the campaign screen, there's no delay timer that'll show that'll give you an indication of how long it will take for orders to be received by a commander. The only way to really visualize that on the battlefield is to watch for a courier. So let me show you an example of that. Now, I've given an order to General Sherman for his division. That order is going to come from General Grant in the form of a courier. So General Grant has to prepare that order. And now the courier is being sent out. You can see him here. So we know that that order will not be received by General, Grant, uh, General Sherman until that courier arrives and then expect a further delay while Sherman prepares and distributes that order to his division. You can see here on our battlefield map that there are a number of victory points that are currently shown in white because they have not been taken by either side. Once you take and hold a victory point for your side, it'll turn to your color and you will begin to score victory points at a particular rate. And those will be shown here on either side if you have that uh, option enabled. Uh, here, if we hover over where it says indecisive, we'll see a running tally during the battle of victory points earned from objectives, from the overall morale of your army, uh, from any routes that you have suffered, and from any losses that you have suffered. And all of these contribute to which side is winning the battle, and the greater the disparity between one side and the other, the more likely it is that the losing side will end up retreating or withdrawing from the battlefield. So then, by disabling continuous VP from objectives before starting a campaign, you will be turning off that feature which allows for a continual uh, buildup of the victory points gained from objectives. The last game option that we'll be looking at in this tutorial are the feuds. Let's take a look in the game at an example of that. Occasionally, you'll run into this symbol on the battlefield, and that indicates that there's a feud between one commander and his superior officer. Now this can happen from time to time, especially uh, between professional officers and politically appointed ones. Uh, but it also happens when a lower level commander gains a ton of fame 
uh, and becomes much more famous and much more uh, well-renowned than his superior officer. When that happens, the feuding officer will sometimes deliberately delay carrying out orders. Other times, he may take initiative without orders. A perfect example of this would be Dan Sickles, commanding the Third Corps at the Battle of Gettysburg who took initiative against orders. That's the kind of thing you can expect to see happen when there's a feud symbol uh, and indicating something's going on between two officers. Now keep in mind that any and all of these game options can be disabled, but if you want the most realistic experience in the game, I suggest you leave them on. Good luck out there.